start right into the music because we're here to praise today. Amen. love you so much. Amen. It's time for our children's story. Are the Liebschers going to offer that up today? Very good. One of them is. Kids, come on up, kids. Come on up. Let's do a little Jesus loves me. Okay, where are you? Come on up. Jesus loves me, this I know.
Hello. Hi there. How are you? You are looking good today. Does anybody know what this is? <laughs> Something bad is, you can touch it. It won't hurt you. What do you mean, give me that? It's what? Seagrass. Seagrass. Here, take it. What do you think that is? Some kind of tumbleweed. You're the closest so far. It's not seagrass. It doesn't come out of the ocean. It comes from the hills out in Lockwood where there's horses. So can I have that back after you've touched it? So you don't know what it is? I don't know what it is either. <laughs> there is no point. I just want to know if you knew what it was, because I wanted to know what it was. Do you guys remember Uncle Mark's story last Sabbath? You don't? It was about two boys that were walking through the snow, and one boy was falling down. He didn't think he could make it. And what did the other boy do? The other boy helped the faltering boy. And when they got to their destination, he said, I didn't think I could make it either. But because he helped the other boy, he was able to go on. And he was trying to make an illustration there. So, can I have that, please? Thank you. I was going to tell you a story about the python that we had for a pet. Boy, you really lit up. But the python got loose in our house. And we couldn't find the python. But I decided not to tell you that story either. <laughs> then I could tell you the story. <laughs> Sam, you and I are very much alike. We're a little bit crazy. I could tell you about Emilio the frog that was about as big as a discus, or big as a frisbee, that we found in a cave. And when we walked in the cave, all we could see was his eyes. It scared us. It scared us. But I want to tell you a story about a bird today. OK? So I'm sitting in the kitchen, or in our dining room, one morning, early in the morning. The sun hadn't come up yet. It was still a little bit light. It was just getting light. And all of a sudden, I hear this. And I knew immediately what it was. Can you guess what that might have been? What did you say, Sam? Are you psychic or something? You're right. A bird flew in into our window. So I thought, I better go out there and check and see what's going on. So I went out the back door. We have windows on two sides of our house, big windows. And here is a little tiny sparrow. He was about as big as an egg. And he had flown into the window. And I looked down behind a bench we have out there, and he was kind of sideways on the ground. So I picked him up. And Aunt Wendy has taught me how to care for animals. And they need to be in a warm, dark place when they're not cuckoo. So I picked him up, and I put him in my hand. And I put my hand around him so there would be some warmth for him. And I thought, what am I going to do with this little bird? So I started talking to him. Maybe that's not a good idea, huh? Pardon me? Little sparrow. 
Anyway, very little, only this big. So I talked to this barrel. And he began, he got up on his feet and he stayed in my hand, but he didn't want to fly. So I thought, well, what am I going to do here? So I stayed there with him, had a little talk with him. By the way, I had a talk with him because I had just been talking with Jesus. And Jesus said to me, he said, you better talk to this bird and give him a little encouragement. So I stood there for a while with the bird. And finally, he was on his feet, but he wasn't flying anywhere. I put him on the ground. Just like, no, I put, him on, I put him on the bench where there was a pillow, like a cushion. And I went back in the house, and I prayed for that little bird. I said, Lord, this little bird really knocked his head pretty, pretty hard. It would be really, really nice, Lord, if you just helped him get through this. So I was reading, and I was reading, and all of a sudden, I turned sideways, and I saw this thing go whoosh. It was the little bird. He had come to his senses, and he flew off. And I thought, that is wonderful. That is wonderful, Lord. You've answered my prayer. So when you see a little animal, or maybe a person who has maybe knocked his head on something, what do you want to do? You want to help it, right? You, there's a couple more things to do, too. Pray. That's good, too, right? Oh, say that again. Maybe tell your mom. Tell your mom. I would have told my Aunt Wendy, but she was sleeping. So it was just me. Sometimes we have people to help us. Sometimes we don't. So the object is to always help when it's in our, what's it, within our ability to help. We help whatever we can. We have a Bible verse. Who likes to read? You like to read. Are you a good reader? Okay. Would you read this for us? Here, wait a minute. Let me get this down here so we can read. I have loved you with a, ver with a very lasting love. I have drawn you with loving kindness. Jeremiah 31, 3. Thank you very much. Just wanted a little reminder of how much God loves us. Because you guys have been such a wonderful group today, here's something for you. You can pick out your favorite color. These are uh, some of the remnants of... Well, we don't want to make this a laborious process. Oh, by the way, I tell you what, why don't you pick one and you guys kind of, uh, Ella, would you like one? No? Okay. Would you like one? She said yes. I'm sorry for this. I really am. I didn't expect this to be such a... Next time I'll just have one color. These are uh, miniature surfboard fins, and uh, if any of you don't know, I have a, an attraction to surfing, and this is one of the products that a Rainbow Fin Company Thank you so much. You can go back to your seats. And I want to ask all of you to give those to your mommy and daddy when you get there, please. I'm going to uh, abbreviate these announcements because of the long children's story, but I would like to direct you once again to the um, bulletin. It, it is the news of our church and add just a few things before we enter our worship service. Uh, you'll notice uh, right there under today, this week, uh, children's Sabbath school leaders, that is 
youth and what's the term that Arlene used? Youth and younger, those class um, leaders and parents, if you'd like to sit in on that, are invited into the sanctuary uh, right after worship, right? And um, we're going to we're going to always communication is important. Would you agree with that? This is a communicating time for us with our Sabbath school teachers to make our Sabbath schools vibrant, healthy, and relevant. The next uh, item that is not in your bulletin is that uh, Pastor Stevenson, Michael Stevenson, and his family will be here someday. <laughs> we don't know when, but the plan is that uh, he will be preaching the first Sabbath in November, which is November 7th. So uh, I'm encouraging you and your friends and others who may not be here today to be here to welcome them. Uh, as you can see, he has a note to us in the bulletin of encouragement and, and direction. So um, let's give him and his wife and family a wonderful welcome when they are here. Uh, he may actually be here sooner than that, but uh, we're not sure. I think that's all the announcements we have at this time. So uh, at this juncture, my wife, oh yes, thank you, thank you. We, did we have a welcome today? We did not have a welcome. Well, shame on us. We want to welcome all our visitors today and have prayed that this would be a uh, wonderful, rewarding, enriching experience today for this short time we have each week to gather together. Um, and my wife has just reminded me that we have prepared lunch for all our visitors today. It's in the stone house right across the driveway. So please, please join us and welcome to the Riverview Adventist Church today. At this juncture in our beginning of worship service is a time of worship in giving. Today's offering is for the Nevada-Utah Conference. Would the, uh, the deacons come forward, please? Shall we pray? Our gracious Heavenly Father, we're thankful, Lord, that we can sit in this safe place. We're thankful that you have just poured out your grace to us in Christ. And now we come, Lord, with praise and glory and honor to you, and also with a small portion of the blessings you have given us. All we ask, Father in heaven, in the name of Jesus, is that these gifts go to advance this conference's efforts to bring your good news to many. So we entrust them to you, Lord, Father in heaven, in Jesus' name, amen.
Let's continue on with our praise and worship now. We invite you to stand again with us as we will uh, we'll go from song to song. Join us in praise.
you to come forward and join at the prayer altar with us.
special requests. That's why we stand here. Before we uh, kneel for prayer, there are some loved ones in our congregation that would like us to lift them up, and we would like to do that. Lena is not feeling well, the uh, matriarch of our church. We want to lift up Danae and her family. She just had brain surgery, which was only half successful that we know right now. Of course, Mary Beth Joe, who is in Korea right now, seeking treatment. Uh, I want to pray for James Dewitt, one of our family members, Marcella Brief, some of you know her. And we just got a request this morning for Shelly, who are, is the Lang's daughter-in-law. Um, evidently, there is some serious health issues there also. And I think I remember Jamie telling me that Elizabeth has done well. Would you kneel if possible? Father in heaven, we come to you, Father, because you are our creator, our redeemer, and the one who sustains us every day. You are the one that placed hands on the sick. You comforted the afflicted and the oppressed. You encouraged the discouraged. And you have offered your own son for our salvation. We have been washed and cleansed in the blood of Christ. So we come seeking you, O oh God. We come seeking that healing that we need each day. We're seeking that healing for each one of these that we've mentioned. And we pause for just a moment, Father in heaven, to remember those in our lives, each individually, that we, as we kneel in this room, friends, neighbors, children that need your healing touch in some way. We're thankful, Father in heaven, that we can come to this place in safety and peace and realize that many in this world cannot do that. We pray for those who go out and minister in other countries. And as we worship and thank you for your grace to us, we pray for your presence here. Pray for Brandon as he speaks. May your Holy Spirit not only speak through him, Father, but also speak to us through him. Open our ears, open our minds, open our hearts, that we might receive your word that will bring glory and honor and praise to you, O God our Father. Thank you for your word. Thank you for hearing this prayer. In Jesus' name, amen.
just uh, we'll just keep right there. <laughs> Change my heart, oh God. I, you are the potter, I am the clay. That is such an appropriate song. Thank you, everybody. And I also want to say a special thank you to our young people who are up here doing music. Isn't that wonderful? We had Ani singing, Cole doing percussion, and Hannah was playing. And uh, I know Hannah just hates it when I draw attention to her, so she is right there. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for your goodness, for your love, for your mercy. Speak to us, guide us, work through this, this broken instrument that you have, have given words to. Open the ears of those who are here so we can hear not what I have to say, but what you have to say. We love you. Amen. I have a confession to make. Your bulletin isn't exactly right. Last night, um, I just felt impressed with something, and I felt like God told me, change your sermon, and so I did. And so it's a little stressful, and I'm preaching something that isn't completely written out, and that's okay. But in your bulletin, it says two keys. Um, change that to one. As I was studying, these are just such big topics and things that I really want to dig deeper into. And, and I felt God, like God was telling me, you know, you just, just, just sit on one for a little while. And I said, well, you know, they wouldn't mind if I last took an extra hour or so to preach. They really wouldn't, I, I swear. And he, he says, no. And I know you're all thinking, oh, we could have done that. That would have been okay. Um, <laughs> so anyways, uh, we're moving on, and that's, that's what this is going to be. So it's going to be the one key. And I want to start in by talking about a video that I saw a while ago. There was a video circulating around Facebook that was about this. Does anybody know what this is? It's a monster energy drink. And this video was going around Facebook, and it was about this lady that was talking about mainly the, the symbol here, the, the logo. And then I think the logo meant to look like a, a three-tiered monster. It ripped through the can, right? And it's got that green there. And uh, her thing, she was talking about, well, these really look like a Hebrew symbol. And uh, I guess kind of. If you look, they look kind of like a Hebrew symbol, right? And she was saying, well, this Hebrew symbol just happens to be the sixth character in the Hebrew alphabet. And so if you put all these together, it's six, six, six. And then she goes in and she says, and the name of the drink is called Monster. And how is the devil described? He's described as a monster. And one of the really strange things about this whole, this whole kind of thing that she was going through is that at the end, there was no point. It was just monster, devil, demons, the end of the video. And I'm thinking, what, what are you trying to get at? Are you saying that, 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 that the devil is contained inside this little can? Because if that's true, that's fantastic news. And we don't have to worry about him anymore, right? Um, just don't open the can. <laughs> yeah. Um, and it just amazed me how many of my Adventist friends got so excited and worked up over this video, and they were posting it all over, and it terrified me. It absolutely terrified me because I can't help but wonder if we're changing as a church. The Seventh-day Adventist church used to be known, or at least we took a lot of pride in being known as people of the book, as people of the word. We were the educated church. If you want to know, you want to study, and you want to dig deep, and you want to know about how the, the Bible imbues history and how it takes over our lives and how it's actually a, a, a book that is relevant to us today, then boy, you come to the Seventh-day Adventist church but I'm starting to think and I'm starting to wonder, are we as church members becoming a little bit less academic, a little bit less Bible, and a little bit more sensational? 
And it, this, this just terrifies me. You can see it in the debates that are happening within the Adventist church right now. The debates, the scary thing is not so much that we disagree. Disagreeing is okay. Disagreeing is good. That's happened throughout the length of God's people, not just the Christian church, not just the Adventist church, but the length of God. People have disagreed. And that's a wonderful thing so we can come to the table and talk and it, and it draws us into study. It's a wonderful thing to disagree. But it's not that we disagree. It's that we disagree over how we see the Bible and how we read the Bible. And that, to me, is what makes us who we are. And if we cannot come and agree on how we come to the Bible and how we ask our questions and how we study, then we've lost our identity. And that is a very, very sad thing. This summer we've been talking about what happens when God changes your life, when you come in contact with the Creator and how your life changes, and the things that happen to you, and how your actions are different, and how your mind's different, and just the wonderful thing in that how you become a completely different person. But I feel like we need to start talking a little bit more about the flip side of that coin. How do we experience God? How do we come in contact with Him? He gave us the Bible, and the Bible is not just a book. It is, it is, and it, it's, it's an extremely difficult book to read. And I hate to say that because I would love to tell you, you open it up and magically just God comes out of it. And he, no, but you need to learn how to read it. You need to learn how to study it. And this is why um, we're jumping into this two keys to life, love, and God. As I, today it'll be just one, remember. And as I look more into, the, the study is called hermeneutics for those of you who are geeks and like big words. Um, the study is called hermeneutics and it, it, it talks about Hermeneutics is the study of how you take what you read and interpret it. And so I want to talk about that. And the more I think about hermeneutics, the more I think about how we interpret, the more I come to realize that the basic principles of how we read, the good principles of how we approach the Bible, are the exact same good principles as how we should approach our lives. And when I realized that, I was so blown away because I'm just like, God— you put the exact same things. If we, just, if we just get good at these few things, that's the key to everything. That's the key to a happy, successful relationship with your parents, with your wife, with your husband. Hopefully you only have one. Um, with, with, with your kids and with studying the Bible and with God. And it's, it's amazing. And so that's what we're going to be going for this morning. Boy, this is wiggly. Sorry. Um, and so here's the main point. Here's the main point of the entire sermon. You've got to want it. This is the first key. And this is what we're going to be talking about. You've got to want it. And many of you are sitting there thinking, well, that's ridiculous. Of course I want it. I want my money back. Well, we already took the offering. It's gone too bad. But here's the thing is, is we, all, we all kind of know people that are always right. You know what I mean? You know, you walk in, and it doesn't matter what you say. They're always right. And if you could take every single piece of scientific evidence, and you, can, you could prove it all out, you could take them to the place, it doesn't matter. They're always right. And the thing is, after a while, you quit, you quit trusting them because you think nobody's always right. And so obviously, they're always wrong. You know, and it's because they're, they're just more determined. I heard a really interesting interview on NPR this week, and I really wanted to get the, the manuscript, but I couldn't find it. But they were talking about that, that comment that uh, Benjamin Netanyahu had made about the Holocaust. Many of you have heard that. He blamed um, the Mufti for getting, um, getting Hitler to do the Holocaust. And so they, they brought in this expert, from Jerusalem and said, well, is this true? And he says, well, absolutely not. We've got documents saying that um, he was planning on doing this beforehand. He was, you know, he was getting ready. He had already done some of this stuff. And here's the important part. The interviewer comes in and he says, well, why on earth would he say that? Was he just lying to everybody? And his answer was this, and I just thought it was so wonderful. It was something along these lines. Again, I couldn't get the quote, but he says, we don't interpret history to find out the facts. 
we interpret history to prove what we already think. We don't interpret history to discover facts. We interpret history to prove what we already think. And I think that that is so tragic because so often we walk into our lives and into the Bible doing the same exact thing. I don't listen to my wife because I want to know what she's actually saying. I listen to my wife because I've got pre-ideas about what I think that she's already saying. Or I don't approach the Bible in a certain way. You know, I mentioned, I mentioned the song. You know, we are the potter, or you are the potter, we are the clay. And um, it's just, how often do we act like that? You know, we, we as an Adventist church so often act like truth is a destination that we've arrived at. We've got the truth. You hear that all the time. We've got it. It's, at, it's like we, we possess it and we have a market on truth. But we think about, you know, we're clay. We're clay and God is shaping us and God is molding us. How could we possibly be so arrogant to think that we can fully understand the potter? How can we be so arrogant? A while ago I saw a bumper sticker that said, don't believe everything that you think. Don't believe everything that you think. And I, at first I was kind of offended by it. I was like, oh, they're calling me wrong. I'm not. Maybe I should not believe everything that I think. It's true. Imagine it. Imagine how, how do you know that what you believe is true? Is it because you grew up Christian and this was all you were always taught? What if, you're, what if you grew up Hindu or Muslim? How would you know that that's right? It's only when we come to a state of extreme humility, when we can approach the Bible in such a way that we want to know God's truth so badly that we're willing to expose our beliefs to what God has to tell us. It's scary. It's a scary thing to do. Because what if our whole system breaks down around us? Are we allowed to question what we believe? I'll give you an example. Hell. We love talking about hell because we don't believe in it. And I mean, that's good news, right? Yay, no hell. But a lot of, you know, most other Christian denominations um, do. And they firmly believe it. And there's a story about this guy named Rob Bell. Not Ryan Bell, Rob Bell. There's a difference. Rob Bell is kind of a titan in, in the general Christian world. He's written a lot of books. He's got a lot of followers. He's quite a theologian. And he built a megachurch in L.A., I believe it was, in L.A. And he started it from the ground up. He started with just a few people, and he built, and he built, and he built. And it became this massive church with thousands of people that, that attended. And it was this huge church. And he began to study. And he began to see something that was wrong. And he finally came out to his church and he says, you know what? I don't think that our view of hell is quite what we think it is. I don't think that it's this everlasting burning place that you go to for eternity. He says, I cannot believe that. I don't think that the Bible has to say that. And the reaction from his congregation, the congregation that he built, the elders of the church that were there, they asked him to resign. Because they said, we cannot deal with having to restructure our entire theology. A theology that's so firmly based in something, we cannot deal with having to restructure it based upon this idea, this new idea that you've come to. Do we do that? I mean, are we susceptible to that? To coming to think, I'm not going to allow my theology to be subjected to the Word of God. I mean, it's silly, really, if you think about it, but it's scary nonetheless. And if our theology is correct, wouldn't it make sense that God would confirm it, not deny it? So why are we so afraid? 
The word is called eisegesis. Again, for all you geeky people out there. And ice for my, where are my students out here? What does ice mean into? Oh, I already gave it away. Darn. Okay. Ice means into, right? Ice to Jesus. So I, and Jesus means study. So the study of, I, or when you do ice to Jesus, it means that you're, you're going to the Bible and you're going to pick it up and you're reading into it. And you're actually going to put your own ideas into it. And we don't want to be doing that, but that is such a big thing that happens all the time. Psalms 25, 9. And this is about spiritual, spiritual humility. The way that we can approach the Bible, spiritual humility. Psalms 25, 9 explains that only to those who are humble will God explain. Only to hum- those who are humble, God will judge. And the word there, it's Hebrew, it says it's anon. And it means humble, it means gentle. Um, I love this. It means humble, lowly, meek, and poor. If we, it's only when we admit and we can, we can process that I am poor, that, that, that spiritually and mentally and theologically, I'm poor. God, I need more. And when you feel that need, that he will start, be, begin talking to you. We cannot, we absolutely cannot be careless with the Bible, brothers and sisters. And as I, I look around and I see, all from, from, from our top superstar evangelists all the way down, they seem to be just careless with the Bible. And they seem to be arrogant. And we do that too. And it's so hard not to be. But we cannot. Isaiah 55 says, Your thoughts are not like my thoughts. And your ways are not like ways. And the difference is like the difference between the heavens and the earth. We've sent satellites out, you know. They've been traveling for years, and they still haven't gone to the edges of heavens. Dare we, dare we think that we can grasp God, that we've come to the end of knowledge, And possibly, you know, there's been a lot of, of talk in the Christian world right now talking about how, you know, I don't need religion. I don't need theology. I just need Jesus, right? Your religion is what causes you. Well, here's the thing is I believe that there's a reason for that. I believe that theology has lost its power. And here's why. Theology is theo, right? And ology, the study of God. Theo is God. And theology without God is just study. Why do we want to be a part of a church? Why would I want to be a part of a church that just studies about God, for God, but not with God? But sometimes we do that, and it really concerns me. This last week was the anniversary of the great... Depression. It doesn't sound very fun to say, does it? Like, anniversary of the Great Depression. 171 years. And we think about that, and, and that was a terrible time for these people. I mean, the Great Depression is not said lightly. When this time came, people sold everything that they had. They went, they went out. They were ridiculed mercilessly. <laughs> There we have magazine articles that are talking about, you know, the Millerites and, oh, Jesus is going to come, watch out, you know. And they, these people were putting everything out on the line, including their reputations. And then when the day came, the day passed. And it seemed like all the accusations were true. Jesus really wasn't coming back. And now I've got a family that's hungry and no way to feed them because I sold my farm. And I have no friends, really, because they all think I'm an idiot. And I, what do I do? It was horrible. And so many were lost on that day. So many came back and just said, that's it. I'm done with God. But there was a small group of people that said, no, we refuse to accept that. And they came back. And they came back and they studied. And they studied. 
And that's what started the movement that is the Adventist church, is people refusing to believe that God left them alone. That is the kind of dogged determination that I want to see restore the Adventist church to a movement, to restore theology, the, the theo to theology. And we haven't always been perfect. After that, there, there, there was one particular conference, the 1888 conference in Minneapolis, that was, that was so much wrong was said during that, so, may, so much bad, um, bad blood, so much arguing, I should say, was said during that meeting. And Ellen White said some very pertinent things that I think are so powerful to our current day church. I'm going to read you. She says, Jesus has invited, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Learn from me, for I am meek and lowly in heart. And you will find rest unto your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. She says, if we daily learn the lessons of humility and lowliness of heart, humility and loneliness of heart doesn't include we're right and everybody else is wrong. <laughs> there will not be feelings which exist right now. There are some differences on views on sub subjects, but this is reason for sharp. Is this reason for sharp and hard feelings? Think about that. Have you been in the church and dealt with people that have sharp and hard feelings because of differences in opinion, differences in theology? Ellen White says right here that is. That is no reason to treat people poorly. Shall envy and evil surmisings and imaginings and evil suspicions and hatred and jealousness become enthroned in our heart because of this? All these things are evil and only evil. Our hope is with God alone. Let us spend much time in prayer searching the scriptures with a right spirit. You hear that? This is important, searching the scriptures with a right spirit, anxious to learn and willing to be corrected. See, that's the hard part, willing to be corrected. It's scary to think that our entire worldview could fall down around us or undeceived in any point where we may be in error. If Jesus is in our midst and our hearts and are melted into tenderness by his love, we shall have one of the best conferences we have ever attended. Skipping forward a little bit. We know that if all would come to the scriptures with hearts subdued and controlled by the influence of the Spirit of God, they would be brought the examination of scriptures. Now listen to this. An examination of the scriptures, a calm mind, free from prejudice and pride of opinion. The light from the Lord would shine upon us. His word and the truth would be revealed. But there should be prayer, painstaking effort, and so much patience to answer the prayer of Christ, that his disciples may be one as he is with the Father. The earnest, sincere prayer will be heard, and the Lord will answer. The Lord will quicken or strengthen the me mental facilities, and there will be seeing eye to eye. I just love that. You know, this, this speaks so drastically to us, and I'd have to say, from, from the things that I've read and the things that I've heard, the meeting after 1888 came together, and people took this to heart, and there was peace, and there was good conversation, not, not strife. This is why it's called fruit. Remember the, the fruits? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. See, truth has a beautiful subtlety to it. When truth, real, honest, God's truth comes into our lives, it doesn't give us righteous indignation. It gives us love. Gives us joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, hmm, self-control. A gentleness, a kindness, it invites others to be a part of it. It does not coerce, it does not anger, it does 
not beat others into submission. Sometimes I think it's funny when you hear people talking about truth, and it's like two people in the boxing ring, you know, poof, truth, poof, truth, 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 and the guy is in the corner like, ah, you know, do you, do you, do you accept the truth? Yes, you know, it, that, that's not real truth. It's like, it's, uh, any of you when you were kids have your parents like, tell your brother or sister, I'm sorry. And you go, sorry. And then your brother or sister goes, sorry. Are you really sorry? No, of course not. But that's, that's what I'm talking about. But as adults, it's kind of the grown-up version of that, right? And it's come to the place where we, we kind of self-deceive to the point where we don't even understand it. We don't even realize. And we'll just say, God, I'm looking for truth. Bloop, 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 bloop. Hey, here's something that I want to read. But are we searching? Are we humble enough? Sometimes we get so wrapped up into this delusion that we can and have understood and grasped God so fully that we forget the far more important goal of understanding God, that far more important than understanding God is the fact that he understands us. Sometimes we come out and we feel like we need to to have God all figured out. And we forget that sometimes we just need to rest in the peace that when God tells us something, it's not because we need to know or we already know how that plays out. It's because we have to come to the place that we know that God understands us and that what he's saying is right. God is crazy about you. I know we say all the time, God loves you. But, you know, as a comedian might say, You've all been to a Thanksgiving dinner. You can love somebody and not like them. But God likes you. He's crazy about you. He wants to be with you. He wants to communicate with you. Let's not let our arrogance be the barrier that keeps that from happening. We must approach God emptied of self, confident that he brings us truth and willing to accept that that's what it is. We cannot allow our own ideas to drown out his voice. So let's do it. Let's become the people who have humility that marks us. Let's become the people that brings us back to the place where we are known for being an open and willing to lay our pride and our arrogance aside in pursuit of the truth that draws us closer to God. Not the kind of humility that thinks, makes us think less of ourselves. We're not calling ourselves to be depressed. But the kind of humility that, means, that makes us think less about ourselves. It may be uncomfortable. It may shatter what you consider to be truth. And it may reform it. And it may destroy your life. But it's worth it. So are you holding back? Do you need a new heart of flesh, as Psalms may say? Do you really want God? Do you really want truth? To the extent that you're willing to let him shatter the beliefs you hold so dear and throw away your past. Do you need a heart conversion? Join us in the movement to so doggedly pursue truth of God no matter what in our hearts and in our minds. Join with us, uh, join us now as we close with a, a favorite word. Wonderful, merciful Savior, precious Redeemer and friend, who would have thought that a lamb could rescue the souls of men? Whoa. Comforter, keeper, 
kindness, gentleness, self-control. In the knowledge that God will guide you and that he will remove the arrogance that you may not even know about in your own life. 